Welcome to the Galactic Tech Museum in Munich, Germany. We're right now entering the room with the young man depictions. What these were originally described as is actually as a pile. But it's actually just a young man. This, this is from about 540 to about 560 BC. This one too. It's an amazing work of Greek art. This is where Greece and Rome was, the kind of cities that they had. This museum in itself is a beautiful work of art. What's interesting about when you come into this room, it's almost kind of like in a pantheon to have an oculus, being able to have the sunlight coming in. This statue is the fawn, apparently half man, half horse. It's uh, stood in the gardens of Rome in the past, and then later was in the palace. So, it's a beautiful work of art. This is kind of interesting. We have two satyrs playing the flutes over here. And you have, see over here, up here today. Kate, um, goddess of the crossroads. What's interesting about ancient Greek statuary is that it actually um, um, wound up influencing Rome. And after the Roman uh, Empire conquered um, the Greeks, they actually imported a lot of their culture and started modeling their um, statues after them. For example, this is a satyr. The goat like it, half man, half goat. And what's interesting about it, this is actually a Roman version after about a 300 BC statue. This is a beautiful depiction of the Gorgon Medusa. It's uh, also a symbol of Armani <laughs> in ancient Rome. That's what's interesting about this one is that it actually is more beautiful than uh, deadly. This we have here is a sacrificial scene of a family with a god standing in the right hand. See, this is Hecate, the goddess of the crossroads. She has three sides to her. And she's very rare on ancient coins. Look at that beauty up there. Now we're entering the room of the Adams, um, which this is the feature of this room is this little statue, um, a Roman version of the ancient Greek statue of a warrior. It's absolutely stunning. Over here, we have a Roman version of the Greek goddess Athena from circa 300 BC in all its beauty and might. Let's see what else is interesting in this room. This is a head of Ares, the ancient Greek god of war. This guy is known as a king. Notice how how well the ancient statue captures the human form. Over here we have a male. A lot of the statuary actually comes from um, time periods where uh, people passed on. And a lot of this, this for example, is a funerary relief where the woman is uh, greeted by another woman. It's actually 
work of great artistic beauty. This is a female panther. So these were mostly grave markers actually. This museum of the Galapagos actually has 15 rooms. This is the room of Aileen, the goddess of peace. See, she, she's depicted here holding the baby. Over here, we have a Satan actually holding the baby Dionysus in his hands. Dionysus is the wine god. Notice that here it has a these uh, lines as an as in the green part, you see? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, this is an amazing work of art too. It features a man actually completely prostrate and in the act of actually dying. This is actually a beautiful depiction of Aphrodite or Venus. Look at her form. It's absolutely stunning. I want to get a nice look too from here. Absolutely beautiful. Over here we have uh, Satyr. Satyrs were, you know, uh, gods of the woods. Can you see? That's one of that's one of his uh, depictions over <laughs> here. Now let's move on to the next room. The next room is the room of the huntsman. Hunting was a sport that was rarely, um, that was enjoyed only by the very rich aristocracy. So the main centerpiece of this one is this huntsman right here. Notice the little hound dog behind him. This again is uh, some female rate monuments. The interesting thing about female monuments is they're allowed to um, capture the achievements of the of the person that you know was buried, and it's usually some of the wealthiest actually were able to uh, put such a great site together. Right now we're entering to the room of the temple that was found on the, in ruins on the top of Aegina. So in the pediment of it, you had actually this statuary. What this statuary actually stands for is um, it goes to the history of the uh, Trojan War. Notice Athena heroically at the center and around there's uh, various different figures such as Hector and the such. This is what the temple used to look like when in the, you know, in perfect formation. You see, this is uh, where the pediment was. Isn't it beautiful? Here's the head of one of the warriors over here. This is what the pediment was looking like. It's absolutely stunning.
You see there's uh, people shooting in the act of dying. It's, it captures art, it captures motion, it captures everything all at once. So this was the west side of that temple's pediment. This over here we have the room of the Sphinx. Basically a nice little cafe shop with a view to the outdoors. Great place to have a nice cappuccino. Now we're gonna see the west pediment of it. So this basically uh, artwork, this the sculpture was actually bought on auction by my understanding King Ludwig. King Ludwig the Great of Germany. This is what it looked like on top of the mountain in the past reproduction. Now we're going to be entering the room of Alexander the Great. The statue that features in the center is actually a Roman version which uh, took uh, his uh, portrait and put it on a naked nude bust. So this is Alexander the Great, this is what he looked like. This one's kind of interesting. Notice on the right hand corner there's actor's mask. So this is some sort of an acting scene. This is another portrait of Alexander the Great. Amazing to have this kind of stuff. Um, it, it isn't even recommended, let's say, if, when you travel. So you're going to have, uh, you know, a view of all the museums as possible. So now we're entering the Roman statuary room. What's interesting is that Roman statuary got to its highest level of development during the times of the Roman emperors. So over here, we have an interesting, on the left-hand corner, we have an interesting combination. You have Marius on the left hand. And Solo, who winds up defeating him. So, um, that's a story. Solo was actually the first dictator. He was the one that crossed the Rubicon and became dictator for the reorganization of Rome um, before, actually, <laughs> Julius Caesar did. Uh, he set, actually, a dangerous precedent that wound up leading to the fall of the Republic. Over here, meet Emperor Tiberius. Emperor from 14 to 37 AD. This is Olivia Drusilla. This is the sister of Emperor Caligula. That's Olivia over there without a head. <laughs> Meet Emperor Augustus. Emperor from 27 BC to 14 AD. See a portrait of a woman. This is what a toe-gate man used to look like. Now, let's move on to where the further statuary. Nero fiddles as Rome burns. That's how <laughs> the story is told by some. And here is Emperor Nero. There are many different uh, feelings about Emperor Nero because we have to understand that uh, the accounts that actually are left for us historically is actually is actually um, from the senatorial rank. This is Emperor Titus. Emperor Hadrian, who was preceded by Emperor Trajan. Emperor Trajan ruled from 98 to 117. Emperor Hadrian ruled from 117 to 138. 
he was the adoptive son of Emperor Trajan. There's another portrait of Emperor Trajan. Behind there, there is actually a mosaic of Eternitas, the depiction of Eternity. He's surrounded by the wheel with the zodiac symbols on it. And on the bottom right hand corner is actually a depiction of the different seasons, the four seasons of the year. Oh, interesting um, thing that Adrian actually had a favorite. He had a young man that is uh, believed to be have been his lover. This is what he looked like. And after he died, he actually built a city named after him. His statue was, all over, was found all over the Roman Empire. So I meet Antinous. Now, meet Emperor Marcus Aurelius. Marcus Aurelius is def de depicted in films such as The Gladiator. Um, amazing story, actually, uh, the story of the general Maximus, Maximus actually really existed, but the whole idea of him becoming a gladiator doesn't really exist. Emperor Marcus Aurelius was actually co-emperors with Emperor Lucius Ferris, meet Lucius Ferris. Emperor Marcus Aurelius wound up doing um, things such as wars, things such as administrating the empire, while this guy got drunk. <laughs> oh. Now... Let's meet Emperor Antoninus Pius. Antoninus Pius was um, the adoptive um, son of Emperor Hadrian. And uh, he uh, wound up in, um, adopting Marcus Aurelius. That was known as the period of the adoptive emperors. But Mar Marcus Aurelius actually wound up breaking that um, adoptive emperor cycle down by actually having his son see Marcus Aurelius over there, by having his son Commodus become the next emperor. This is Commodus, meet Commodus. It's very amazing to actually look at the statuary and what you actually can see uh, is these people in real life, not just the little portrait on the coin. Over here, let's meet Emperor Septimius Severus. This is Emperor Septimius Severus, 193 to 211 AD, he was emperor. And this, I believe, to be his wife, Julia Domna. Very interesting. Look at how expressive this portrait is. What's interesting to note, see this woman, it's not a, um, uh, actually specifically an empress, but it's from that time period. And she um, mimicked the uh, style, the hairstyle of the royal lady. Now, let's enter to, to, into the womb of Apollo. See, up in the center, you see Apollo holding the lyre. Oh, over here we have Emperor Domitian in full heroic nudity. He was emperor from 81 to 96 AD. So, now back to Apollo. Down here we have um, a portrait of Sol, the sun god. Uh, the equivalent, the Roman equivalent of Helios. Over here we have Artemis, which is the equivalent of Diana in ancient Rome. Notice the little baby stag at her feet. And look at the depiction of it. Isn't that cute? This is actually the bottom part is a more modern, but the head, the head is ancient Artemis, but then she actually got changed into the goddess of abundance. Over here you can meet Dionysus or uh, the Roman equivalent of Bacchus, the wine god. Notice the little panther at his feet. 
and notice also the diadem made of vines and uh, grapes. This is known as the statue of the drunken woman. See, she's in grief and she holds a big wine flask. Over here we have Satyr Marcius, who challenged Apollo to uh, a game um, of uh, where he played the flute, and he said that he was actually better than him. And as punishment, after he lost, he wound up getting hung up on a tree and flayed alive, as the story goes. This is a young boy holding a goose. Isn't that cute? Now we're back to the main hall, and I'd like to introduce you to King Ludwig I, who is actually responsible for making this museum happen in about, I think, 1810s. Uh, then during World War II, actually, this uh, museum was badly damaged, and then reopened in 1972. And I'm going to be making my way out to the street to show you how beautiful it is actually from the outside too. Beautiful column facade in the front and you're walking outside and you just see the stunning beauty. There's also a lot in the museum across the street that has a lot uh, more exhibits of various ancient Greek pottery and more statues. This actual museum, the Glyptotech, is styled after an ancient um, Greek temple in its full majesty. You see over here there's a rotunda too. There's a little circular area where people could um, drive their car around. This concludes my tour of the Glyptotech. I'd recommend you visit my site, trustedcoins.com. That's T-R-U-S-T-E-D, coins.com. I sell authentic ancient Greek and Roman coins, and uh, I love providing more historical and deep information, and so much more on my site, trustedcoins.com. See you another day. Bye-bye.